I'm quite familiar from my studies with um, about data privacy in the era of new and emerging technologies. I think it couldn't be more up to time right now because of all the developments with ChatGPT, with all the rapid uh, developments in artificial intelligence. And there's so much to uncover what this actually means for our daily lives. Um, and not only for our daily lives, but also for our data, which we um, share every day, which we use every day in the web. Um, and I'm happy to tell you more about like what this all means for you. Um, maybe a bit more about myself first. So who am I? I was already introduced, but maybe a few words more. I'm based in Karlsruhe, which is a small city in Germany. This is a map of the uh, of Baden-Württemberg, a part of Germany. Actually, um, this is also where our company is located. So I founded uh, Ask UI, which is um, a UI automation tool, basically. Uh, we are a team of 14 people right now uh, working here on our vision of a better world. Um, so we are also like very heavily researching on AI. Um, so for us, AI is a tool for automation, but it brings a lot of different kind of challenges as well. So I'm happy to dive deep into there as well. Um, as already mentioned, uh, there are also a few communities which I lead and initiated, um, or we at the company also do. Um, there is the Automation Advocates, which is a Discord community. We organize a lot of events as well. Um, by the way, we are always looking for guest speakers. If you ever want to have a talk presented uh, to a broader audience, I'm happy to chat. Um, also, we have a meetup group called Software Testing Karlsruhe, which is more of an international group right now. Um, and yeah, we are sharing talks about mainly software testing, uh, test automation, automation in general there. Um, so this is kind of an off-topic talk from that sense, but um, I think Data privacy is a topic which all of us affects. Um, other than that, I'm also a speaker and moderator um, at a few events, uh, mainly test automation, software testing. Um, maybe you've seen me there already. Um, yeah, and also if you ever want to chat with me or reach out to me, have any questions, please feel free to connect me or connect to me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to have a have a have a chat. All right, so let's dig a bit deeper into the talk itself. So what will you actually learn today? Um, when I was researching on this on this talk, uh, I actually found a lot of stuff happened uh, in the in the last few years uh, in the space. Um, and for us, for me, it's really important to uh, bring you some kind of awareness to how important data privacy is actually and how it all affects us there are different kind of challenges with it but it, it's it wasn't the, like today is the time where it's the most important of all time um, and this won't change in the future data privacy will get more important every day uh, where, where we live by because there's so much data in the web laying around uh, which can be used for whatever reasons with with um, you don't even know what what it's used for sometimes and uh, it's it's really important that we are aware of what what can happen and where our data is stored um also more on new technologies what kind of technologies are used how do they process data how are they transforming our lives um how did the history look in that um and then also in the to the towards the current state of data privacy um so what regulations are actually in place. I found a very nice place where you can actually check on all the data privacies. Uh, I want to dig into that page a little bit later um, and also go through a, part, through a few regulations. I know we have a very international audience, um, so uh, there's a lot of different kind of regulations. It's super confusing sometimes, um, but uh, I'm hopefully I can uncover a bit of it. Uh, also key challenges, what kind of challenges are there when accessing some data privacy problems together with some practical advice. Um, there are a few tools out there which you can use. Um, and also like more about the importance of actually taking action and doing something with your data. Maybe you already took action in the past. Maybe you don't care about your data right now. Uh, me for myself, uh, I kind of, I am aware uh, that there is a problem, but I never took really that much 
action on it. Um, so it's, it's for myself even it showed that there is a need for for being more on it. And maybe to start with that, with all these new technologies coming up, um, I'm not sure there's this privacy paradox on, uh, which basically describes the fact that everyone, if we ask like here in the audience, if we would do a poll, um, everyone would be saying, I'm aware that data privacy is really important. I care about my data. But on the other side, the data shows that more and more people share their data actually on web and are less aware of how it's used and care less. So that's called a privacy paradoxon that you actually um, think you care of your data, but actually don't by sharing it everywhere with in social media, for example. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we can dig a bit into the importance of data privacy. So I was researching, I mean, every one of you probably heard about ChatGPT right now, um, which is this large language model where you can, basically it's a, it's a chat bot uh, with which you can um, communicate and it's really useful for a lot of different kinds of tasks. You can ask them stuff, it comes up with code, um, it helps you build stuff and it can also write certain kind of texts, for example. Uh, but also there are a lot of challenges with it when it comes to data because it was actually trained on a, on a really huge data set. And uh, this data was scraped uh, from the web. And this, it, it could be that there is private, private data in there, uh, which are happening to have some data privacy concerns with it. Um, and still, we are not sure like what is processed there. And we even cannot tell because it's like kind of a closed system. Um, and that's one of the reason why, for example, uh, Italy banned ChatGPT due to privacy concerns. Um, if you were not familiar with that, there was a breach uh, where on March 20 this year, actually quite recently, um, where they leaked information or the conversations users of ChatGPT had with the chatbot. And you could see all those kinds of information laying around and use that and read through that, which is super confidential. Um, so for that reason, Italy, it's up for discussion if it's if it's like if it should be banned or not. I, I think probably not, but we need more regulation in the space uh, concerning the, the data privacy there. Um, another breach which was out there uh, was this uh, breach uh, of Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A, uh, I think it's called pronounced, um, where. Actually, also recently, um, where a lot of people customer data got leaked. Um, so we have to like consider which kind of data is is here leaked. So it's email addresses mostly and passwords for logging in, for example. And with that comes typically like names, uh, birth dates is also kind of part of like uh, data, uh, like privacy data or data which is really important that we don't share it. Um, and yeah, so this that shows basically that even major companies are not cannot be trusted completely with our data although they seem like to have like a huge amount of employees and working on that and still there is a way where people um or way where data breaches happen um why is it because we have like a lot of new innovations every day um so in our daily lives as i mentioned with ChatGPT, there's artificial intelligence coming up um, I guess last year was the year of the blockchain or the year before um, where we tried to decentralize a lot of information um, and putting stuff on, on blockchains. Um, and not only crypto, also like all rar like various use cases, ticketing systems and stuff like that, where stuff is stored in, in wallets and then decentralized. Um, also, a lot of data stored there and a lot of scams actually happening in the space as well. So very was a very uh, concerning uh, development there with all the scams, um, but not. let's not dive too deep into that. Then uh, IoT devices, um, you all connect to IoT, IoT device, Internet of Things uh, every day. Basically, we want to connect everything which is out there to the Internet, which has, a, has this huge advantage that we can communicate within like through different kinds of applications all over the place and we can access the internet all the information which is stored there um, it also has a huge downside um, and this downside is basically 
that it can be hacked and um, information stored there might be not that safe as we think. So, for example, I have this device here on a, on a car. If you think of Tesla out there, uh, Tesla is basically a software company. It's it's making cars. They are making cars hardware, but uh, they see themselves as a software company. And with software companies, they also process a lot of data. They can be remote accessed, and they are updated through the air. And um, that is great from a technolog technological standpoint. Um, but it can be also very um, concerning from a from a data standpoint um, because what data is stored, how can it be accessed? What is actually happening if the device, if the device or the IoT device is hacked, or uh, if you think more on the home devices, smart home, uh, also a field where, for example, refrigerator have cameras now, or there's security reasons, uh, security stuff, and if it's not tested correctly or not secure enough, uh, we don't know who can access stuff which is stored there or who can access those cameras, um, and I think there's a lot to to solve uh, in the future. Um, another technology, biometrics are more and more used. Um, also your fingerprints, for example. So biometrics is basically your, uh, it's a unique identifier for your, you as a person. Um, so it can be fingerprints, it can be your eyes, it can be um, your face even with face unlocking. Um, so which stuff which looks unique for you um, biologically. Um, yeah, the most famous one is probably fingerprints. And fingerprints are he like heavily used everywhere for unlocking stuff, even like uh, in devices. Um, so we use also face unlocking, um, but no one really thinks about all the consequences with like storing that. We kind of think that it's safe, that they know what they are doing and there are a lot of regulations, but without those regulations, if, or if we're not aware what kind of regulations there are, people could actually just store plain fingerprints on your phone and then if it's hacked, they have your fingerprints, um, which should not be should not not be a thing. And another technology, the last one uh, which I want to mention, which is heavily improving, but we don't know yet what it means for our daily life, is quantum computing. So quantum computing is basically a new way of building a computer instead of like zero and ones, like a two-sided system. Um, we can now have like multiple states where we compute, which exponentially increases the amount of computation power which we have, or which we will have. And this also means that there will be a lot more computing power to hack systems, to, um, to build systems, which is great because we finally can, can simulate stuff which wasn't possible before. We can simulate worlds even maybe, build way better artificial intelligence out there. But also more hacking power, more brute forcing enabled. Um, and maybe some security systems out there, which are right now in place, uh, are not made for that kind of power yet. Uh, and the technology evolves faster than the regulations. If you look at it from a historic standpoint, um, innovation was, by the way, always the driver of our economy. Uh, so it's great that we have innovation and all these kind of technologies. Um, so I just looked at this graph here. It's uh, for infrastructure, but it's it's true basically for any kind of innovation out there. So what it shows is before the year 2013, um, basically like the amount of years on the x-axis, and then it shows the GDP per capita. Uh, so basically some kind of economic uh, value, you would say. Um, and what we can see is, so there's a global average and there's the highest for all countries and the country which was the highest. Uh, and then uh, on the bottom, there are those infrastructure inventions. And if we have like a look on the way back, uh, we, we have like temples, canals, water supply, stuff like that, uh, which is like basic, basic infrastructure. Uh, we see that innovation, first of all, rapidly increased. Um, the speed of innovation. So we then had um, gaslighting railways, telegraph, electricity, uh, airports. It's all like infrastructure, but basically you can think of with AI developments as well, with uh, mobile phones, with um, the stuff with upcoming. I just talked about blockchain and all this kind of stuff. And you can see that the GDP is actually rising quicker and quicker. 
uh, which means that we have way more economic value. And uh, also we like to think about it that automation, for example, it's like a bit off topic, but automation, for example, uh, can help in building a world where economic value is created just or enough economic value is created in this world where no one has really to work. It's kind of a, a very long-term vision, but uh, if we look at it, I think it's possible and then everyone has the chance to work freely. Um, but yeah, what, what this shows is basically that um, innovation is the key driver and we shouldn't be concerned too much about that we need it, like, but also there's this challenge with data. Um, and I want to show this challenge here. Uh, just do this real quick. Um, so what this graphs, I've brought here two graphs here um, with the new challenges. On the left side, we have the amount of data stored in this world. And on the right side, we have the amount of data breaches uh, out there. Um, if you just look at the, at the left side, um, both of us are from Statista, you can look them up. Um, it's basically the data volume in zettabytes. Um, and 2010, it's not too far long ago. Like I was, I was, I was still studying back then, but um, basically we had only two zettabytes stored in total data. And in 2023, we are already at 120. Uh, so it's growing exponentially um, and it's expected to grow to 181 zettabytes in 2025. Um, so just in pure data volume, which also means that more and more providers are storing privates, privacy related data from you. Uh, and there are more and more surfaces which can be used for attacks um, and needs to be secure for, for breaches. Um, it's just a statistical thing that if there is more data stored and more surface area to attack, that there will be more data breaches. And we can also see that on the right side. So uh, if we look at the amount of data breaches, uh, there's like on the x-axis, there is the year from 2005 to 2022. Um, and then there's the number of data compromises and impacted individuals. And I was really surprised by looking at this chart that back in 2005, even before the 2010 on the left scale, uh, we only had like 100, uh, 157 data breaches um, or data compromises um, and it grew rapidly. So there's this, on the right side, there's this gray scale, which means individuals impacted in millions. And if you look at it, there was in 2016, I'm not sure which data breach it was. Um, there was this huge effect on it that almost 2.5 billion people, individuals were affected by a data breach, that their privacy data, that's like a meaningful percentage of the world population affected by a data breach. Um, and I think we are not safe from any of that. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really uh, hard to see um, or really concerning to see those data, like how affected we really are. And I will later go to a website called Have I Been Puned, uh, which is basically a, a place where you can check yourself or your email address for being um, like being part of a data breach in the in the past. Um, all right, but first, before we move there, I have this, which I found, uh, which is basically, I know we are all from all over the world. So I also wanted to show you a, a a world map of what kind of regulations are there actually. So we have, we've learned now a lot about how technology evolved, how it's a driver of our economy, um, and that there are a lot of data breaches and a lot of data stored and a lot of challenges coming with it. But what kind of regulations are there already in place for that? So uh, it's actually, that's the current state in 2023. There is 71% of all countries in this world have a legislation. 9% have a legislation in draft, which basically means it's not active. 15% um, uh, have are countries with no legislation at all. And then 5% is no data on it. Um, and maybe we can just jump into there. So to see 
Uh, so I think you're still probably seeing only my slides. Let me. I want to share new the soup. Okay. Now you should be seeing my this this world map which I just showed. Um, so let's have a look. Maybe so maybe first of all you can have a look at the United States. Um, you can click on it and. Uh, see here, okay, electronic legislation, blah, 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 cybercrime, and then we can check into that. Uh, for us, it's data protection privacy laws. So for this legislation, what we have is the Privacy Act of 1974. There's another one in California, which I will talk later to it. But here we see that there's actually pretty nice data on it, that there was something in place um, and that they were um, having a thought of it. Um, if you look more into the African region, there's a lot of countries which have stuff in place, but Sudan, for example, Libya, um, if we look into those countries, there is actually no legislation on anything, which means if you are a business doing, or if you are making business there, or an individual which goes there and shares private data, um, basically there's no rule that your data must be uh, handled privately, privately uh, they can just do whatever they want with it. So, um, I mean, it's really interesting to see because if you happen to move there and there's no regulations, they mean they just don't care about your data. Or maybe they care or the businesses care, but at least there's no regulation on it. Um, other countries involve Papua New Guinea, Afghanistan, um, Bangladesh, for example. Um, there, and so maybe which one I will also show is like uh, Germany, um, where I'm from. Uh, we have a lot of legislations, maybe too much as well. Uh, so what do we have here? We have the GDPR, uh, which I will shortly show as well. General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, by the way, I'm not an expert in all of those kind of legislations uh, which are out there. It's just too many to, to uncover. Um, if you want to have a look, just go there yourself and then you can um, just go there. There's for India, for example, I think a broad audience is probably from India here as well. Um, Information Technology Act 2000 uh, and the Personal Data Protection 2019, um, which is actually completely outlined here. So you can read through it yourself and see what's, what's in place, uh, which I find really, really useful. All right. Oh, perfect. Now it works. Um, Right, I said about GDPR, so let's jump into that. It's one example for legislation which can be in place. Um, basically, what is it? It sets rules for how organizations handle personal data of EU citizens. citizens. Um, and it was introduced quite recently. Uh, don't count me on the year. It was, I think, 2019 or 17. Um, I would have to check, um, or even before that. Uh, well, it's you can Google that. But um, anyways, so it, I was actually still studying when it was introduced uh, as well, or just starting my professional career. And I remember that there was this huge fear of, oh, wow, what, what's happening here? Um, every company has to introduce that. I was participating in a few um, part-time projects where we then had fear, okay, we cannot do a website anymore because we have to implement that and this and, and so on and so forth. In the end, it wasn't too bad. We still have the uh, cookie banners now for, because of that uh, mainly, but um, that's another topic. I think it's it solves basically, there's a reason for it, um, especially if you look at all the developments. Uh, but what does it mean? So um, I actually copied that graphic from the official GDPR side. It's a EU side. Um, what can happen uh, for a business which uh, uncovers it? First of all, basically, it's for any company who's doing business in Europe. So uh, if you don't have a seat in Europe, and it's also for only for companies, not private, not for individuals. It's only for uh, companies doing business in uh, the EU. Uh, not Europe, but in the EU. Um, 
and they are and companies which try to collect or uh, process any private data um, which fall into those privacy uh, regulations. Um, companies would pay, pay fines up to 4% of the turnover um, if they breach it, um, or 20 million. Um, it depends. So it's it's pretty expensive to not be according to those laws, to be honest. Um, if there is a breach, it, the company must notify the authorities within 72 hours. Uh, must be um, reported, otherwise uh, you are up for some fine, uh, fines. Then increased territorial scope, uh, as I mentioned, applies to any company processing personal data of EU citizens, regardless of location. So you must know if your business trying to grow internationally, that's also one challenge we had, you must be aware of the regulations or the legislations which are in that country you want to move towards to, not the one you have to sit in. Um, consent matters. This was the fact or the reason why there was all this cookies banner. Then after that, uh, explicit content must be provided in intangible and easily accessible form. Uh, and there must be always a way to opt in or opt out of some data. That's why there's this opt in, opt out uh, option if you go to uh, sites from the EU. Um, right to access and portability. Basically, this means if uh, you are an individual and contact a company within the EU, and want to have or want to know what kind of data they store, um, they the company must share that information with the individual. So if you, for example, happen to uh, are in contact or using any service from an EU company or falling, which falls, I'm, if you're a EU citizen, you can do that and then just ask the company, hey, I want to know what kind of data is there. And then you receive a list, what kind of personal data they have or private data they have. And then you can also request that it is, is is deleted. Um, yeah, so breach notification, I talked about that, and then privacy by design. Um, data protection from the onset of the designing of systems rather than a retrospective addition. This refers to um, if you design systems, privacy should be always on top of your mind, should not be something you think is a nice to have. But within the system design, it should be always like one of the key areas which should be thought through and implemented right away. Um, right to be forgotten, that's um, also, I mentioned already that next to the right to access that you have the right to get uh, data erased or deleted. Um, and then mandatory data protection officers, uh, which means that people have to appoint some certain persons or companies have to appoint some persons within their organization, which are aware of all that and see themselves um, as the main uh, go-to person for all those kind of questions and which are responsible for implementing all that or making sure you are com compliant with those regulations. Um, another example I want to show is the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, which is in California, or uh, it was introduced in January 2020. Um, so, it's a, by the way, it's a, like, um, oh, there's a, the date when the GDPR was introduced in May 20, uh, 25th in 2018. So not too far off, it was right in the middle. Um, yeah, so where's the, where's the difference? Um, basically, the CCPA is also for profit companies um, that collect personal data on uh, California residents uh, on uh, more than 50K. Uh, have also annual revenues of over 25 million and earns 50% of annual revenue from current Fernia residence data. Um, it's quite a difference because the company has a, quite to be a bit larger for European or EU companies. It's a bit, at least for small companies, it's a bit more challenging because uh, they fall under GDPR even if they are only two persons. Uh, if it's like a startup or a very small company, they still have to be compliant. Um, otherwise, they would be up for some fines. Um, but overall, who's affected? Businesses, service providers, third parties, and California consumers. Pretty similar to the EU, but just for California. Um, what data is in scope um, for the CCPA? It's personal data that is sold for monetary or other value considerations. Um, releasing, disclosing, transferring, or even renting of the data. Uh, it's a bit unclear what is meant with just like basic 
storage of data um, if it's not used for any value. Um, so you just, for example, lock in details. Um, I'm not sure how they handle that, but first of all, it's more about data which can be actually used and make money from. Uh, GDPR is way more strict here. They just say personal data of any type, whether you just store it for login or you try to sell it or whatever. Um, and for the fines, also the uh, fines for the GDPR is uh, way higher, uh, up to 10 million euros or up to 20 million euros or 40%. Um, and the CCPR is up to 7,500 per violation with no ceiling on the number of violations. Uh, so it can grow out of really large, real quick. Um, sorry. Uh, and yeah, it, but it just starts way smaller. Um, yeah, and 100 to 70, 50 uh, dollars per consumer, which is affected per incident, which can be a lot of money if you think, for example, if it's a data breach from Google, for example. So large companies are really into some some trouble if they have a large data breach out there. So those were now two examples of those uh, legislation which, which, which we saw from companies. Um, feel free to, to dig into uh, the site yourself and have a look at what is affected, how this is affected, what it means for your company or for yourself as a, as a person. Uh, and if you're planning to do business within those companies, um, what this also means for you. Um, there's also a framement by the uh, OECD. Um, which is basically the OSD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, which a lot of companies are creating frameworks and are organizing and, and doing frameworks for development. Um, um, so there's, this one is the so-called Emerging Global Data Privacy Framework, um, where they have some principles uh, laid out, which should ensure or that, that the company is uh, basically privacy uh, compliant. So what are the principles there? Maybe we can go through it one by one. The first one is the collection limitation, uh, which means that basically the collection of personal information should be limited, as the name, name says, um, and it should be obtained only by lawful and fair means and with the consent and knowledge of the individual upfront. Then also there is this data quality, um, Personal information should be relevant to the purpose for which it is collected and should be accurate, complete, and current as needed for the purpose. So basically, you should consent. You should know when your data is collected. You should consent into that. Um, and you should know what kind of data is collected and for which purpose. Uh, and the purpose specification is the next one. Um, the purpose for the collection of personal information should be disclosed before collection and upon any chance, change to those purposes. Um, and the information should be limited to those, uh, and the use of the information should be limited to only um, to be used for that specific purposes outlined in the document. So that means, for example, if I collect data for your uh, for login process and I have your email address and a password, uh, I should not be using that email address for sending you marketing emails, for example, if I just say that it's only for uh, the login purpose. So um, I would be not allowed to do that in that sense. Uh, I think a lot of companies are not aware of that, uh, but it also depends on the country you are in, if that's a thing. For the GDPR, it's, a, by the way, a very uh, apparent thing. Uh, next one is the use limitation. Personal information should not be disclosed or otherwise used for other than a specific purpose without consent uh, of the provincial or legal authority. Um, should not be disclosed, like not be shared anymore. You should not be going away and saying, okay, I have this list of 500 email addresses signed up. Do you want to buy that? Um, don't sell data, don't share it, don't be transparent. Just that, be transparent about what data is collected, how it's collected, for what use, but don't share the data. Be safe with the data, basically. Uh, security safeguards also refers to that, that the information then should be protected. It should not only be shared, it should also be protected with reasonable security safeguards. What that means is actually not that clear, but like state of the art technology. So it's um, secure uh, for unauthorized access, modification, disclosure, and so on. 
Um, openness. Uh, the public should also be informed about privacy policies and practices. That's where you see on the website the data privacy um, pages always. And individuals should have ready means of learning about the use of personal information. Um, individual participation, we can go through the uh, next ones. Um, individuals should also have the rights to know about the collection of personal information, um, to access that information, to request correction, which I already outlined that you should be um, asking the provider or the, the company, hey, what kind of data do you use? Uh, and if they, for example, tell you, okay, we are using this kind of data and that, that data we do have stored and you see some error, you want, uh, it to be deleted, they have to do it. They cannot say, okay, you you gave me the consent two months earlier, I want to use it now. No, um, the individual has the right to actually get it deleted. Um, and then accountability, uh, which means individuals controlling the collection or use of personal information should be accountable for taking steps to ensure the implementation of these principles, which means there is always one dedicated person uh, in the company um, which feels responsible for uh, doing that and is also countable if those things are not implemented correctly. Um, about obtaining consent, um, it was a huge challenge when we started our company first because you need to be GDPR compliant and it's, it's really, really hard to get all the consent cookie banners and stuff like that. I think the user experience actually, uh, it hurts the user experience on a lot of websites that you have so many um, cookie banners out there. Um, but I just presented a few here, uh, which like the website use cookies. I mean, you all know it probably when you go to websites. Um, they all popped up in the EU companies after the GDPR, basically, where you had to implement them. Uh, I think a lot of them are actually incorrectly implemented, um, especially on smaller companies. But it's so hard to see how it's implemented. And I think there is much more awareness needed of like you cannot really check if it's correctly implemented. You can just do this cookie banner there and then you click on it, allow all, but nothing ha is happening in the background. Uh, and it's so hard to check if, if that's the case or not. You can do that by looking at what kind of traffic is sent, what kind of cookies are set and stuff like that. Um, but uh, there's, I, I'm not sure a way um, if this is really like challenged by a lot of authorities right now, to be honest. Um, all right, another challenge uh, besides that is the potential for algorithmic bias, uh, especially in the area of artificial intelligence systems. And there is, I brought this example here. This is, uh, this is the American system for um, classification or like it, it basically rates suspects, uh, how likely they are to do some criminal actions. It's called Compass. Um, and it's it's super biased. So, for example, on the left side we have Dylan uh, with a low risk of three and Bernard uh, with a high risk of ten. Um, and the prior offenses of Dylan was two armed robberies, one attempted armed robbery, with uh, a actual subsequent offense of one grand theft. He's low risk. Um, Oh, this is Vernon, actually, this is another guy. Um, but he is low risk with three, and on the right, Prisha, four juvenile misdemeanors, non subsequent offenses, and is very much on a high risk. Um, I mean, you probably can figure out a theme here where this bias is. It's just racial profiling a lot, uh, which is super unfair and puts a lot of people. Um, in a, in a place where they shouldn't be. We can see that on the right side as well. Uh, there's this James Rivoli, uh, one domestic violence, aggregated assault, one grand theft, one petty theft, one track trafficking with one grand theft subsequent offenses, still low risk and medium risk of six, one petty theft, which also is the guy on the left, by the way, has also that, uh, but with none subsequent offenses and he's put at medium risk. So um, there is this racial bias in a lot of systems. And as we have this data laying around in all of the web and the artificial intelligence is actually trained on that all kind of data, the AI system, it's not really the AI system to blame, it's us humans to blame, which are in a sense very biased in putting out data there. 
um, but we use that data to train systems. So the artificial intelligence systems are also very biased, and that's a, a huge, huge concern for the uh, for the for the for the future and and challenge uh, actually to to solve um, as well. So we have here um, after those challenges. Now you have learned a bit more about that. Uh, there is this privacy impact assessment uh, where organizations can actually run through um, and then basically identify and uh, mitigate uh, privacy risks. So what kind of steps can you actually do as a company um, to solve that? Um, so this is this framework. So first of all, we identify the risk. So uh, we review the corrective actions and derive new objection, uh, objectives. Um, then we classify by evaluating and describing the process operation. Um, we, uh, I think, uh, actually, I should start at the identified. Uh, identif uh, I think the, the order is not correct here. So identify would be identify the risks at that point. Um, then uh, classify, initiate the corrective actions to manage the risk. So first of all, we have to identify the risk. Then we initiate what kind of actions and classify uh, what kind of risks are there and, and how can we actually tackle them. Um, then we review that by, first of all, we implement it and review all the stuff we have, we have thought might be useful uh, going forward and derive out of that some very tangible objectives which we want to achieve. Uh, with that, um, and then in the last step, in the after development, we evaluate and describe the processing operation, um, and check if the things which we wanted to achieve, if we achieved that as well. Uh, sorry that I misordered them here. It should be identified as the first one at the third point. Um, Yeah, so it's a very, very basic framework, but um, I think it helps to just go through those four steps. Okay, think about, okay, what kind of risks do we actually have? For example, um, I can go through my example as a software company. We could say, okay, what kind of data do we actually have? Where is it stored? So we know, okay, we have login credentials, for example, email addresses, we have passwords. Um, we store some test cases in our application, which are related to this customer. So these are test cases are not really that data privacy concerning, but email addresses are. So uh, we also store names, first name, last names of people. So, um, okay, so there we have like a touch point. We have email address, first name, last name. Okay, so now we have identified our risks. Now we can classify them. How how critical are those informations? So it's not really a banking number or anything which could directly hurt something. So. Uh, it's still privacy concerning, it still falls under the GDPR, so we need to make sure it's sure. Uh, but it's like, if it's lost, um, we couldn't be sued like all over the place, but we should be aware of it because email addresses and names are still like stuff which can be used for um, identifying people. So we know, okay, we have to take action, um, but maybe not like top, top, top priority, but high priority. Uh, then how do we want to tackle this? We need a system to implement that. Um, so what kind of options do we have? Are we using a third party um, authorization author 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 system um, where we basically outsource our whole management of, of handling that data? Um, might be a good thing. Maybe they are completely GDPR compliant is one option. Other thing is we implement it ourselves. We have limited resources. We are a small company. so. Um, yeah, probably go with outsourcing using a third-party solution because it's very hard to tackle. So we can implement that. And then after development, we can test on that. So we can actually check in, okay, um, how is this third-party solution storing data? Uh, what are they do doing there? Um, is everything correctly implemented? And then we are GDPR compliant uh, on that system and we have uh, implemented the correct measures to tackle that uh, risk. Um, before that, there was also privacy by design mentioned, um, which is basically in the GDPR, it's outlined there that you should be implementing privacy uh, by design, which means just by like building the system, you should be already thinking about like how to handle privacy there. Um, there are seven principles in general. Uh, I want to go over them real quick. 
So there is, first of all, should handle proactively, not reactively, um, which means you shouldn't wait until a data breach is happening and then start implementing stuff. You should actually be thinking, okay, what kind of data breaches could occur in the future? And then preemptively like uh, make sure that they don't happen. Um, privacy, the second one is privacy as a default setting, which means privacy should be uh, there all times. Um, it should be set to default that it's on. Uh, with opt-in or opt-out. Um, privacy embedded into design, also the same thing. Um, you should have a solution where it's uh, basically embedded into your core principles of your architecture. Um, next one, positive sum, not negative sum. This means it should be considered like negative sum means basically you're thinking of privacy. Okay, I have to take some trade-offs. Um, positive sum means there should be no trade-offs while implementing uh, your privacy um, system or how, how you want to handle this data. Uh, it should be immediately clear that you don't have to do trade-offs with your other architecture decisions or other things. In there. Um, at to end security where it can occur means uh, you should have like a clear understanding of the end-to-end -end workflow from like uh, where comes the data in, how is it processed and where it's stored. And this whole system, this whole workflow of like data processing should be secured from like first touch point to like really end touch point. Um, then also visibility and transparency, be transparent about your how you design your system, how you store data, how it's used. Um, and then seven, respect for user privacy. Don't take it on the, uh, the light side, just be aware like what this means for your users, users are giving you uh, their data and you they, they trust you that you handle it correctly and don't uh, just throw it around. It's really hurting your business and it's also not compliant with all um, the stuff outlined. Um, about sharing. So secure and transparent data sharing, just a few words on that. Uh, if you look at current organization structures, we have down there is a typical system which could like which could be outlined within a business. Like what kind of um, touch points are there for data? First of all, there's data sources, AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, software actually store the stuff. Then there's the data domain. What kind of data is there actually stored? There can be sales data, customers data, uh, there can be marketing data, there can be HR data, finance data, and so on. Um, and then who is sharing that data, which is there, who is using that within the organizations, can be different teams, um, can be the sales team, support team, marketing team, HR team, or finance team. For example, here, marketing team probably needs data to sales data, uh, also the finance team probably, because they want to know like how much revenue are we doing? Um, and then how do we share this? Um, it can be business intelligence, usage dash dashboards, which are internally data science, email campaigns. Uh, if you, for example, have to opt in, have some email address, which you can use for that, um, or for revenue projections, which are coming out of this specific department then. Um, so that's like laying out the workflow a bit um, to see where is it stored, Actually, I think it's a good habit to actually do this as a company to see like, okay, what kind of data storage system do I have in place? What kind of data is stored? How can I cluster it in which domains? Um, and then see where do I use it? What kind of dashboards? Which team needs access to what dashboard? Maybe restrict access there. Um, so it can be shared accordingly internally and externally and you have a complete outline of the project. Um, also a need for AI principle arises with all this AI stuff. I talked uh, a lot about that. That's almost before I'm done with my talk. Uh, one of the last points, there is this AI Google principle and the OECD, uh, OECD um, the AI principles that just occurred because with all the ChatGPT stuff, um, there is a need for that. Maybe we can jump into one. Um, I hope my sharing works again. Um, yeah, I think you should be seeing it now. Um, what does Google, for example, tell you when uh, you look at their AI principle? 
Uh, Google is by some great technologies that solve important problems and help people in their daily lives. We are optimistic about the incredible potential of AI, but what do, you, do they actually have? They actually say be socially beneficial, uh, avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. It's the thing which I talked about, the system which is trained on a lot of data, which is, is like privacy concerning maybe. Um, we build and test it for safety, be accountable to people, incorporate privacy design principle. Here, here you go. Um, uphold high standards of scientific excellence and be made available for use as a court with these principles. Um, so they clearly state how they will develop the system um, and that they are aware of the privacy concerns, which there are and how they handle it. Um, you can have a look for yourself what's actually outlined there. Um, maybe as a second factor here, uh, the OECD AI principles are pretty similar to that. Um, so they are robustness, secure, transparent, human-centered values, um, accountability, very important. We can jump in there. Um, and then, yeah, so there's also another map, um, which I'm just seeing here, uh, which initiatives are related to AI policies. Uh, I think it's a very new topic coming up and there's a lot, there will be a lot happening in the future. So uh, keep an eye out on that. Um, what kind of policies are there? Um, and maybe read through them a bit. And there's a lot of stuff happening. All right, so. And now we're basically done. Um, with the talk. Uh, so maybe to summarize what I pointed out here is our world is changing um, and data privacy needs to adapt as well. Uh, I think the regulations which I showed is like they are, take long to implement, um, they are needed. Sometimes innovation moves faster than actually the data privacy regulations, but yeah, let's see. Uh, how it all will evolve. Uh, what you should have learned is that innovation is a key driver of economic value um, and data privacy is a key area of interest, but very challenging to implement. I hope you've got some indications how it can be implemented and how the regulations are outlined there. And that there also are no organizations need to feel responsible for handling user data, that there is awareness out there and especially with all the AI systems coming up and IoT devices and stuff like that, that we need to be more aware of that data and uh, be more transparent of how we use customer data and, and share that. Um, that would be it from my side. I'm happy to... Uh...